So what I'd like to do today is start out and by asking you about some of these these people and just to get your reactions. Mm -hmm. The first one I'd like to ask you about is Ben Webster. When did you first become aware of Ben Webster? When did I first become aware of Ben Webster? Well, I would say probably in connection with the Duke Ellington band. I first uh, heard Ben Webster's music and, you know, realized, you know, he's a great musician. Now, you, were, you were a big fan of Coleman Hawkins at the time. Mm -hmm. He was my idol. What was it about Ben's sound that, that may have been a little bit different than Coleman Hawkins? Well, Ben's sound, of course, was much more gruff, you know, and, uh, and uh, yet he had a very sweet sound also, but he had sort of a more gruff sort of approach. And um, it was distinctive, very, very distinctive. Uh, the great Eddie Lockjaw Davis uh, was once called Baby Ben because Eddie had that sort of gruff approach to playing, you know, that Ben, uh, ben originated, you know. Uh, was there a competition between Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins? I, mean, I City, imagine. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Go, 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 go ahead. Now, in Kansas City, there were these battles where they really tried to. They went head to head. Right. Friendly competition. Yeah. Do you think that uh, that was something that uh, they were conscious of, or just something that happened in a jam session? They were conscious of it. Yeah, the fact that you know I'm Ben Webster. I have to play a certain way to uh, show people that I can stand up to my, the other tenor players. Well, yeah, that was part of the, of the, uh, how shall I say, the, uh, in the uh, DNA of jazz people, you know, we had the cutting contest. That was just part of the way it, it went, you know. Did you know Ben personally? I knew Ben personally, yeah. Can you share with us anything about, about Ben the man? Well, I, uh, I didn't know him that personally to know everything about him. For instance, uh, Jim Hall, uh, the guitarist, told me that uh, he knew Ben. He said when Ben was young, he was sort of, his, his grandmother and everybody had him sort of like a little Lord Fauntleroy when he was in school, you know, with the knickers and all this stuff. So this is quite the opposite image you would have of, of uh, the gruff Ben Webster. Uh, so I never knew that until I uh, spoke to Jim. But uh, uh, Ben was a very, um, you know, I think Ben Webster one time thought he could beat up Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion. I think he, uh, I don't know if he took a punch at Joe Lewis or something, but Ben had a very strong uh, macho thing about him, you know, so that uh, this was sort of part of his persona, you know. Is that why they called him the brute? Yeah, yeah. But he had like a another side just his ballad playing is just unbelievably sensitive. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. He was very, very, very sensitive. He wasn't gruff as as uh, his uh, more uh, other songs that he played that were, you know, more up-tempo and so forth. Lester Young. When did yes. Yes. Become aware of press. Well, Brett, you know, I uh, on my block where I lived, we had uh, a lot of a lot of people were very much involved in jazz. I mean, we all loved jazz from all of 
you know, people my age and so on. So um, I was a big Holman Hawkins fan by that time. So one day a friend of mine came down the street. He said, Sonny, who's the greatest tenor player in the world? So I said, Coleman Hawkins. So he said, no, Lester Young. So I said, what do you mean Lester Young? Coleman Hawkins. So anyway, I said, well, let me find out who this Lester Young is, you know? And um, then I, you, you know, I began, uh, I'd probably heard Lester Young, but not, you know, knowing a lot about him. Then I began uh, realizing why somebody might say that, you know. Lester was uh, non-parial, you know. When Lester arrived, he was like stylistically, diametrically opposed to Coleman Hawkins. I think you. I think you could say that. I think you could say there were two styles, uh, roughly, the Coleman Hawkins style and uh, the way Lester Young started playing. People in the Coleman Hawkins style would have included Ben Webster in a sense, and people like Herschel Evans, the great. Cole saxophone play in the Count Basie band with Lester. They would be in the Coleman Hawkins side. Now this, these are rough lines we're drawing here. This isn't, you know, I mean, as time goes on and we begin to understand, then we realize that it's not quite that black and white, you know, it's a little more nuanced. And as years go by, it becomes much more nuanced. At least in my case, I appreciate both Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins and try to use both of their styles uh, to, to build my efforts on, you know. So it can get much more nuanced than it was back then. See, back then there was two camps, as you correctly alluded, yes, Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young. Lester Young, the man, was kind of a, a unique individual, uh, kind of a fellow who marched to the beat of his own drum, so to speak, with his own language, his own um, yeah. way of life. Could yeah. You, for those of us who didn't, weren't there, can you say, t tell us something about Lester the Man? Well, he was very inventive, you know, like you hear these hip-hop guys today that uh, create uh, little fast lines about things. Lester was like that. Lester could, you know, would have a name for everything, a nickname for everything, a way of... of uh, defining something, everything was instantaneous, instantaneous and genius-like. You know, I mean, there was just nothing like it. A lot of people began copying the course, you know, like, cool, oh, it's cool, oh, let's the youngest. He might have been the first guy to say that. I don't know. It's possible. You know, a lot of his sayings have become common uh, but uh, yeah, he, he was really really a um, a great trip that I'm on in life, to have known all these people. You see, this is fantastic that I knew Lester Young and, and knew Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins, all these people. These are great people. And uh, believe me, I know that I've been blessed. Okay. Lester Young's playing has a certain 
sensitivity. Well, do you think he was a sensitive kind of a guy? I mean, he, he had, unfortunately, a short life. I know he was a horrible problem in the Army during World War II. Do you think that uh, his sensitivity uh, as an individual is reflected in the way that he plays? I think, yeah, she, I think he was a sensitive musician uh, and a person, yeah. Uh, I think that's why he probably, uh, it's, it, it's hard to analyze people. I mean, every musician is uh, sensitive. Ray right. Nance, the trump, trumpet and violin player with Duke Ellington, he was a sensitive person, you know. I knew Ray well, and you know, all these guys are sensitive. Uh, let's just playing had that sort of, you could f really feel the sensitivity in his playing. So, you know, he, he revealed it in his work probably more than a lot of people. So you could hear that melancholy, you, you know. Yeah. Let's jump over to Coleman Hawkins for a second. Your first, one of your first major influences was Louis Jordan. Right. Uh, what was it about Hawkins that grabbed you when you first heard him? Well, you know, Brett, Hawkins had a little more, how should I say, intellectual capacity to his playing. Uh, if you could describe Lewis Jordan as earthy and more direct, Coleman Hawkins was more subtle. There was so much more depth to what he played, and there was a musical depth. I mean, the things that Coleman Hawkins were playing were on a par with what people would think of as, as Stravinsky or, or uh, one of the classical artists of Europe who made uh, musical contributions which changed the idioms. You see, so Coleman Hawkins' music was on that level. He was playing things which were to influence a lot of people, a lot of styles, and, and getting really playing music theory. You see, uh, Louis Jordan wasn't necessarily playing musical theory. Louis Jordan was playing, you know, gut from the gut greatly, and so. So that, that you, you have to be sure not to say, well, this is better than that, or this is better. I, I don't want to make that no. judgment. They were separate, yeah. you know, yeah. both and. So, uh, but in Coleman Hawkins, this is what I, what attracted me to him because to be able to understand what Coleman Hawkins was doing, you had to know more music. I mean, you know, maybe with Louis Jordan, you had to know music, but there's more feeling, you know. But with Coleman Hawkins, you know, you had to know theory to order to play like that. And that was a challenge and something that I saw as a young aspiring musician, I saw that this was, I better learn this, you see? So that would be the difference, I would say. Now in 1939, when he released Body and Soul, mm -hmm. that was, in essence, state-of-the-art improvisation at the time. I mean, that was just an unbelievable statement. Was it recognized in the musical community as the, as the the important piece of art that it was? Well, remember, I was only nine years old at that time. So uh, 
I can't speak for the musical community. I do know that it was ubiquitous on the jukeboxes of Harlem. You know, you could go in any place in the jukeboxes in those days, and that's what you'd hear. That would be on all the jukeboxes, you know, which in itself was a revelation because I know Thelonious Monk once asked Coleman Hawkins, he said, Hawk, how could you make a song that's a ballad with words, lyrics, and you played, and you didn't play the melody, and you didn't, there was no words, and still it became a hit. You know, so this is still a, this is, the man created, I mean, uh, a Body and Soul was a masterpiece. It still is, it always be. And uh, far be it uh, beyond me to, to explain it, but it was, uh, you know, it's why Coleman Hawkins is in the firmament, you know, of, of, of this music. So you grew up and you heard him, his music affected you. Some years later, you played with him, you recorded with him. And that's true. What was that like for you to be with someone, to collaborate with someone that you admired so greatly like that, that had such an influence on you? Did you feel, were you in awe of him when you played with him? Uh, I was always in awe of him. Um, I had gotten to uh, know Coleman before that, I mean, before we made a record together. Um, he had heard of me and all this stuff, and they think he heard me and all this, and, you know, so uh, he expressed that, yeah, he liked me, you know, like this young guy, Sonny Rollins, and all this stuff. So uh, when we played together, it wasn't like the first meeting, you know, we, we were already familiar uh, with each other. But yeah, I, I was in a certain awe of him and uh, uh, it, it presented a, a uh, challenge how to play myself but still be natural and normal in myself while I still had these, this feeling of awe for him, you know. But uh, I'm glad I, uh, we did make those records together and uh, we also played together up at Newport and uh, it was my great uh, my great honor and uh, a great blessing and uh, to have the opportunity to do that, you know. Really very more than grateful to, to as I said before, to have been with all these people. <laughs>